and when they put microphones in front of me and then they say it's live streaming this puts me in, in caution because sometimes i have a tendency to tell some nasty jokes or something <laughs> so i have to be careful what i say because sensibilities of people who hear hear me in different countries they are different i have just uh, made a trip round the this planet and stopped in several countries on the way and i find that people speak different languages they eat different kind of food they dress differently but their spiritual seeking is identical no difference their capacity to love is identical their need to be loved is identical so there are some things which is spiritual love is a spiritual thing thinking is not thinking is a mental thing if we want to divide spiritual from mental we can easily do it what takes time to do is mental what happens spontaneously spiritual you appreciate something spiritual sudden you just like it no time to think why you fall in love sudden you don't know why but to want to think should i love that person or not mental i have done so much for so and so what have they done for me how can i love it's mental whenever there is thought involved it's mental when no thought is involved spiritual the reason is simple that mind cannot function without time and spirit soul does not need any time and that is why spiritual things happen spontaneously appreciation of beauty is one of those things love is one of those things intuitive knowledge intuitively knowing something like gut feeling suddenly knowing is spiritual but to reason over it mental we sometimes know spiritually that we have something we have to do the mind says no there no sense in it and we avoid the spiritual truth that is telling us to do something after few days we regret why we didn't do it because new facts come up new things come up mind is working only on a limited amount of information and data in front of it it can't even remember everything just remember little bit and function on that intuition functions on totality of knowledge it picks up all the knowledge that you have accumulated similarly in karma for example when you perform something by intention or action it's karma on karma you have to pay the result of it if something happens without your thinking about it is not a new karma you are paying off an old debt so that is why there is big distinction the another distinction is that what is will will power people talk of developing will power there are two will powers again spiritual will power and mental will power mental will power is based upon what your mind wants to do and you do it as mental will power spiritual will power is what your gut feeling intuitive self says do do it as spiritual will power and sometimes these clash most of the time we yield to mental will power and that's why we make a mess of our life if you look back on the decision you have taken in life you will find most of the problems arose because of the mental will power you used to make mental decisions you overruled the intuitive decision you overruled the spiritual will one of the best way to control the mind is to develop spiritual will and that can not be developed by itself but it's spontaneous it can be developed by denying to the mind its exercise of mental will some people say oh mind is bothering me too much mind mind is horrible i said every mind is horrible mind included mind is made to be like that the mind is supposed to be a machine 
to make us enjoy something created in space and time outside. That's why we have a mind. Now to expect the mind to help us spiritually is taking away its job. Its job was to exercise pleasures, joys of this world. Of course, because of the law of karma, the pleasures also led to pain. And because this whole world was based upon pairs of opposites and duality, therefore we ex experienced something other than what the mind wanted. But that's all mind's game. And therefore to expect that mental will will help us to go spiritually doesn't work. Mind can find thousand excuses for you not to meditate. And it can keep you away from exercising spiritual will. Spiritual will is natural to us because of our natural soul, but we don't use it because we have been accustomed to using mental will. So spiritual will, just like intuition, cannot be trained or built up. What you can do is allow your spiritual will to come into force by denying mental will. Mind says, do this, say no. Not all the time. At least two, three day, two, three times a day. Or at least two, three times a week. Mind wants something very badly. You say no. Mind says one time only. Say no. <laughs> only now. No. If you can hold your no, spiritual will be developed. The reason for that is that why are you saying no to a mental will? It's coming from the intuitive self. It's coming from spiritual will. So spiritual will develops by uh, not allowing the negative will to prevail. The mind will not let you go in. Mind will scatter your attention all the time. People want radiant form of the master which requires so much attention inside. At the same time they are saying, can you help my brother? He is sick. Can you help so and so? And they are meditating and worried where they lost their keys, where the children are. They are worried about outside things all the time. And how can it be that kind of meditation where you see a radiant form which requires so much of concentration of attention within and no escape, no leaking of that attention to outside things, at least for a while. But we can't even hold the mind even for a while. But there's one way you can do it. Deny the mind what it wants to do three, four times a week. Develop your own will and by that do meditation regularly with that style of mental will being suppressed and the mind will go in and once it starts enjoying something inside, it will become your friend and say, let's meditate. This transformation takes place in us. That when you begin to have a pleasant experience in meditation, then you love to have it. In my meditation seminars, which we have, or workshops, I take them through a course. Now we are having these IMRs, Intensive Meditation Retreat. Somebody, I didn't make up this abbreviation. Somebody else made it up said, next IMR, I said, I'm not having any medical examination. I said, they're talking MRIs. The intensive meditation retreat takes us from mechanical meditation, which nobody wants to do, to a meditation <coughs> where we begin to have some interest. Mind still doesn't want to do. Part of us says, I want to meditate. And the mind says, no. If sit in meditation, mind keeps you out all the time. Meditation is futile. Meditation is futile, useless, if you are thinking of outside things. And yet that's how we meditate. We keep on meditating. One year, two years, five years, forty years. Supposing I were to take a particular test in a subject, and I said, what is the success rate? And they told me success rate is 0.01%. I won't take it. It appears that is the success rate in meditation. And we still, still spend years and years in meditating with no effect. There has to be some answer to this. The answer is precisely this. We have neither developed enough spiritual will by denying to the mind its own will 
nor have we had any experiences inside, we should hold the attention inside. So in these IMRs, intensive meditation retreat, after taking them to correct method of meditation, correct pointing out where to sit at the third eye center, how to block the mind by repeating words or mantra, how to try to listen to the sound within. After teaching all this in three days, I tell them, none of that is any use. So what were we teaching then? Three days of meditation and I am giving them the instructions and telling them how to do it and then I myself tell them, useless. But you have to go through that stage to come to the useful part. The useful part is when you can talk to your beloved in meditation. That made it interesting. Every time we have had this uh, longer session of meditation, that makes it interesting. People like it. They want to do more meditation. They don't like me to stop. Such is the power of love and having a beloved. I read the other day, Rumi says, Jalaluddin Rumi says, to have a beloved, you must become a beloved yourself. You can't be a lover if there's no beloved. The lover comes afterwards. Beloved comes first. Some people don't realize that. If there's no beloved, you say, I want to love. It means nothing. Even if you say, I want to love so and so, it means nothing. If there's no beloved, you need a beloved to have the experience of love. Like the Persian poet said in Farsi, Ishka avval dar dile mashuk peda mishavan. Love is first born in the heart of the beloved. If there is no sign coming from the beloved, it will never pull you. Love is not something that you stretch out or give. It is not a mental activity. It is something that pulls you. Now since the only way to have successful meditation, by successful I mean that takes you beyond your mind. If it is within the mind, a lot of people can meditate with struggles, with effort. But successful meditation that takes you beyond the mind and gives you awareness of your own soul, it must be a pull of love from beyond the mind. I know of no other way. I spent my whole life searching for some other way that can take you, push you beyond the mind because all effort of any kind is with the mind. How can you use the mind to push yourself beyond it? So that is why it's the pull of love from beyond the mind that pulls you on the very principle that you have a beloved sitting beyond the mind. One of the main reasons why we need a perfect living master to cross the mind, a perfect living master whose love comes from beyond the mind unconditionally and pulls us. That's the real meditation. That's the real spiritual path. My master used to say, all the paths that lead you to astral stage, to causal stage, or people's paths, I don't believe in that. My path is starting from the soul to its totality. From Parbrahm to Sachkhat. He said, that's my path. Now, the rest of it is mental. We spend so much time on the mental zone, as it were, before we can reach there. But I found that we can shorten the time in a big way by using the process of responding to love of a master right from now, from here. Why wait till you reach the end of the mental region and then think of being pulled by a master? You can be pulled right from here. And how can you do that? By remembering the master in meditation, talking to him, Conversing, sharing whatever joys and sorrows you have, sharing your life with him. You can do anything inside, in the privacy of your own meditation chamber in the sixth floor of your house. What a wonderful gift. And you can start right now. If you start right now, you can experience two kinds of things. One, the pull of love will hasten your experience through the astral and causal planes. Two, if your pull is so strong, the master's pull of love is such strong and you're responding to it, he'll put blinders 
so you don't get distracted even inside from the astral and causal planes and take you beyond. Then you can, after you've taken the beyond, you will understand the whole creation, then you can come and enjoy any part you like. You can come enjoy physical life, you can enjoy astral life, you can enjoy causal life. After you know what all this is, especially if you reach your true home, people don't know what true home is. No idea at all. We describe it in so many ways. There's a lot of souls dancing away, singing songs. There is no space to sing and dance. There is no way to describe something which is not in space and time. We have never learned how to describe that. We don't have any language, any words to describe that which does not exist in space and time. How can we describe it? But one thing is certain, that whatever it is, it's complete, totally, full, because it's the drop realizing it's the ocean. It's the soul realizing it's the total, and soul was merely an experience within the total. When that happens, the whole of creation, right up to the physical plane, is seen as being occurring there. And therefore, you can be at all places at the same time. Perfect living masters sitting amongst us as human beings. They come and sit amongst us as human beings, and we think maybe they did a lot of meditation, they may have some experiences they're going to share with us. Maybe yesterday they might have in experience gone to their true home and come back to tell us what's happening. That is not what happens. Perfect living masters, ordinary human beings sitting here have access to all levels of creation, including its totality at all times, no matter what form. It's impossible to realize if a person can have all experiences simultaneously, is living in all levels at the same time, which you cannot do unless you reach the true home. Because otherwise, the experience is divided into what cover you are wearing. And if you are wearing one cover, you create that. Physical body, physical world comes. Astral body, astral world comes. And that becomes the only reality. We are sitting here. We know no other reality except this. All the rest is guesswork. Maybe we'll go and see something else. Maybe it'll be, maybe it'll be beautiful. Maybe it's not. Maybe your, maybe your true home is not a very great place. But we are seeing all that sitting in the physical body, the physical world. This is our reality. When we leave the body, go to astral world, that is the only reality. Physical looks like dream. All others look like dream too. At one time, we can experience only one reality. Except if you reach totality, then all levels are reality and not reality at the same time. They are all created realities. The process of using consciousness to be conscious of anything is creation. Consciousness has that power that what it wants to be conscious of becomes reality. And this is created on that basis. Consciousness has created the, self, the whole series of universes. Now, it's not only perfect living masters who have that experience. Anybody whose awareness has touched the true home has his awareness available at all levels of creation. Therefore, such a person who is operating with awareness of everything, when he speaks to us, he is not speaking from an experience he had earlier. He's not, he's not speaking from what he learned earlier. He is speaking from what he is experiencing right when he is speaking. And anybody who has that state of awareness can do that. It does not mean that all the people who have had that experience of totality are masters. It is not necessary. Any human being can reach that state and be having the same experience the master has. A perfect living master only has a destiny in the physical body to help pick up fellow souls to travel with them and take them home. It's part of the destiny. It does not mean <clears throat> that 
just because somebody has had the higher experience, he becomes a perfect living master. A master is one who's got a destiny in the physical life. And this destiny is written up when the destinies are written. So the, the beauty of it is, this is open to every human being. Whatever I'm sharing with you is not confined to any particular group, any particular society, any particular religion, any particular nationality, any color of the skin, any age, any gender of the sex. It applies to everybody who's got a human body. You can have all these experiences. So it's very universal. It's a, it's a universal truth which we have access to. So I congratulate you again. You are placed right now in such physical bodies where you have this ability and you have a mind to think, a mind to doubt, a mind to be skeptic. Now sometimes we criticize the mind for its doubts and fears. Whenever a mind has a doubt, it also leads to fear. Fear is a product of doubt. If you're uncertain what's going to happen, you are afraid. And the mind has this built-in quality to doubt and to be afraid. It was built into the mind as a protection. Otherwise, we'd be very gullible people. Whoever any, anything says, we'll believe it. It's not necessary to do that. The mind will stop you from that. It's a good function. It's a good function of the mind to stop you from being so gullible. Anybody says something and you believe it. So you must doubt it. And doubt leads to questions. And you must ask questions. And they must be answered. Some people try to bypass these questions. No, 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 we can't ask questions. Many relig religions don't allow you to ask questions. So many religions I visited, they won't not let you ask a question. It's blasphemous. It's against, as if you're, it's a sin in many religions to ask a question about what is stated in their scriptures is a sin. So the mind has to follow blindly. On the spiritual path, there is no scope and no provision for blind faith at all. It's a living faith. It's based upon what you experience. It's based upon your questions being answered to your satisfaction to the extent you're willing to take one step only. And only when you have a certainty of the first step, take the second. There are two steps that have been built into us with certainty to start with. So none of us is completely without any key at all how to start. So something has been given to us which is already certain and from there we can start. First step of certainty is that we exist, that we are here. Nobody can deny that. We, we know it innately. If supposing 10 people tell us you don't exist, but I know I exist, I'm here. This certainty of existence does not require proof nor approval of anybody. It's a personal experience. All spiritual experience should be as certain as this one. The next certain experience is when you go to sleep and have a dream, you think the dream is real and you don't know where your body is, it's sleeping. You are busy in the dream. Even if you come to know that you are dreaming, you still don't know where your body is. That means you can come to know the reality of your situation and still not know where you are, who you are. But when you wake up, you are certain that you are awake. Absolutely certain. Nobody can question. You don't wake up and pinch yourself, am I awake? You don't open your eyes to check, where am I? You have your eyes closed, you're sleeping, you're awake, you know you're awake. Without movement, what is the state? What changes to give you that certainty? What gives you certainty is that when you wake up, even before you open your eyes, before you have moved, 
you remember that you went to sleep. That's the key. This remembering you went to sleep gives certainty that you are awake and you never ask any question. The proof is built into this. This point is very important because people say, if we go to a higher level of awakening, say astral awakening takes place and we leave this body and awake at a different level, how will we know it's real? Well, how do you know when you wake up in this body is real? Because it connects you with your life prior to going to sleep. If you didn't remember, you would be shaky. Am I awake or not? But because before you open your eyes, you know that you went to sleep there, therefore you are certain that you are awake. Similarly, when you have a higher experience, the certainty comes from the awakening, not because you are going to try to get proof of anybody. These two certainties are built into us. And we should start with these. So if you get an experience of that kind, it's worthwhile then going to the next experience. This is the real key of a spiritual path not based on blind faith at all. Living faith means your faith should grow like a living thing. A living thing will grow. Faith should grow. It should not be a one-time faith. A religion teaches you to have one-time faith. If, if one religion said, God sits on the roof of this house, everybody will believe it. Because religion said so. And it will remain the same. For their entire life, they'll keep on believing the same thing. There's no growth of faith at all. In the spiritual path, every day, there's growth. The growth is not only that you are awakening to a higher level. The growth is your life is changing here also. It's a remarkable combination that when you have something of a spiritual nature, intuitive nature, inside, you have a companion event taking place outside. For example, you get an intuitive gut feeling, a hunch that I should be traveling to such and such place. I want to travel today to London, UK. And you, just a hunch came, how can I go to UK? Your mind says it's not possible. You drive your car and the hoarding says, this kind of beer is sold in UK. You're not interested in the beer, but you're interested in how did UK come up suddenly. It's a coincidence that is happening outside, connected to the hunch you had inside. You'll be amazed how the system works. That you have intuitive feelings inside. You say, where did it come from? And next day you open a book and a sentence reads, what was part of that intuition? You go, a hoarding, nothing to do with you, with you, is reading the words that came in and connects you. You know instantly this could not have come except in confirmation of my intuition. This world is an extension from inside. It's not operating independently. And that is why the, the system operates like that, that you get confirmation yourself. Not because somebody else will tell you. It's your experience. So when I say experience, it is not only an experience of visions and spectacles to be seen inside. It's an experience both inside and outside that's coming and confirming that your intuition is being validated by an experience outside. I also found one thing during the course of my life and my friends that when you meditate regularly, the number of coincidences increase and you begin to notice there's so many things that you never noticed before are now so noticeable. What's happening? It's directly connected with your progress internally. You could be making good progress and not be satisfied because not spectacular, but something is happening outside. I know a person who says, he didn't see much inside, but he's surprised he can't get angry anymore. And he used to be very angry earlier. Now, how can anger be controlled? It's very difficult to control anger. But the person meditates, sees nothing and gets less angry. And ultimately has no anger. It's very difficult to get angry. 
these are all connected signs. So progress can be measured in many ways. It can be measured by a number of coincidences coming, it can be measured by the progress you are seeing inside, awakening inside. It can be measured by your losing things which we all have, anger, lust, greed, possessiveness. All these are things we all have and if they become less without you trying to do anything, you have to give a reason for it. The reason is your meditation. So there are many ways to judge your progress. So ask questions, get answers. If you don't get answers and say, no, block yourself because you're used to religion. No, no, you can't ask questions on this subject. What will happen when you meditate, the mind will sit on a corner with that question. Okay, you don't ask the question, but I'm sitting here to watch. You make no progress. The mind is hiding with the same question. Questions must be answered till they become irrelevant. And that also happens. There was a Spanish friend. He met me in Florida a few years ago. And he did not speak any English. He only knew Spanish. Came for the first time to see me. So, my friend who introduced him, he he told me, this man doesn't know any English and you don't know much Spanish. So I am going to ask him to ask his questions. He has many questions. I am going to ask him to write down the questions in Spanish. I'll translate them into English. I'll read out the English versions to you one by one. And as you answer, I'll retranslate them into Spanish and explain to him. So they both came in they, during the personal time that we were having for interview. And this friend of mine had a long list. The new friend I saw for the first time, Spanish speaking guy. And there were about 10, 12 questions in a long sheet of paper. So he said he has so many questions and I've written in Spanish and also I have written in English so they don't have to translate right now. Question number one. He said, question number one. A friend was sitting on this side, he was sitting across. The friend pounced upon him, picked up the paper and tore it off and threw it away. Say no question. What happened? Where did the questions go? He said, didn't need any questions. They suddenly disappeared. Questions can be answered or they can disappear. How do they disappear? When they become irrelevant. If you are asking questions about going on this road, how to go, what the signpost will be, what, what other things will you will see on the way, and the road is this way. They become irrelevant. When we are on the spiritual path, we have our own mental ideas. What spiritual path is like? There are so many mental questions. When we are affected by love and we know this is a different path, they become irrelevant. So many people write number of questions and then they read out and they say they have already been answered. It does not mean that question has to be answered only by a uh, written answer or by spoken answer. It can be given by an answer within yourself. It either becomes irrelevant or if you are a regular meditator properly, all answers are within you. I sometimes say Nobody can ask a question if you don't have the answer already in you. Supposing you have no answer, you can't write a question. Question is coming with a possible answer in your head. You can't articulate it, you can't speak it out. Another person speaks up, you say, yes, that's right. Supposing somebody asks me a question and I give an answer and they don't like it. No, that's not the right answer. If they know it's not a right answer, that means they know the right answer. We all know the right answers. We just haven't heard it in our own head. We want to hear from somebody else. The truth is, the answers to all questions are already inside us, but they are not at the physical state. They're a little higher state. You go there and you get all the answers. So this is interesting phenomenon. People sometimes say, you give different answers to different people. 
how come the question is the same? How can you change the answer? I said, I give the answer which is in the head of that person. Oh, that means you are just trying to say yes to everybody. I said, in a way, yes. In a way, I am confirming what the answer is in themselves. These questions and answers are built for a certain purpose to avoid getting into a trap and following something that is not spiritual. This was the purpose that we, it's a check, it's a filter that we should ask questions up to a point where we know now it's worthwhile going forward. That's necessary. But if you're interested only in questions, you can put questions all your life because I get a lot of emails with questions. I used to answer quickly. Immediately another question will follow. So my email began to grow. Now I take my time because I know if I send a reply after a month, a question will come immediately. Sometimes I answer at 3 a.m. in the morning and the next answer is, the next question is 3 or 5 a.m. Within minutes it comes back. I wonder sometimes whether people sleep at all, how they are sent a second question so fast. They tell the story of a man in India who went to a village, professor, intellectual professor, went to a village. He didn't know there were wells in the, in the fields, so he fell into a well. And fortunately, there was very shallow water. He did not drown. But he yelled that I have fallen into a well and somebody heard his moaning and groaning and came to the well and he said, I'm sorry to fall into the well. I'll go and bring a rope and I'll lower the rope. You hold it and I'll pull you out or you can hold it and come up. The man professor said, before you go to get the rope, first tell me, how come I fell into the well? Why did I fall into the well? Secondly, before you go, tell me that how can I be certain that you will bring the rope? What guarantee is there? Thirdly, tell me, if you bring the rope, and you may be playing a game with me, and when I pick up the rope, you will drop me again. Answer me these questions, and then you can go and get the rope. He said, can't I answer these questions after I pull you out? Why you fell? I have come to help you to get you out. No, 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 I am not sure. I have more questions than this. How will I know where you are, who you are? I have to ask many more questions. He said, look, you can ask all the questions you want. Just come out of the well. He said, I can't come out of the well till all my questions are answered. He said, then you stay in the well. And he walked away. We can be that kind of person also. And I know persons. They are asking questions all their life and they die without answers to their questions. Because the questions have a problem. The questions have a problem because there can be more than one answer to the same question. It depends on the context, it depends on the person. So, it has contradictions. A person says, if I meditate hard, will I go to such kind? Should I say yes or no? If I say yes, it's wrong. You can't go to such kind of meditating heart. If he says, is it meditation that takes me there or grace of the master? I'll say grace of the master. Then why should I meditate? No, you must meditate to get the grace. But then if I have to meditate to get the grace, that means meditation is necessary. No, meditation can't take you there. Look at the contradictions. If we keep on having a debate on questions and answers, they can go on indefinitely. People read books. This is a book by my own master. His letters to written to American disciples, collection of that, called Spiritual Gems. And people complained to me. In one letter, he's telling, do your meditation regularly, without fear. It's very necessary. To another person, he's writing, meditation can never take you there. It's all love and devotion and it's grace of the master that takes you. Which one to believe? He asked me, 
Which one would you believe? I said, I would believe none because they're not addressed to me. I would believe if it's written to me. Those two letters have been written to two people whose questions require those answers. I was sitting with great master one evening. A man came with his young daughter, teenage daughter. He said, this girl wants to go to college and we think she should get married. What is your advice, master? He said, what's the difference between boys and girls? She should go to college. Send her to college. Thank you, thank you, master. The girl and the father went away. Within 10 minutes, another man comes with his daughter. He says, master, this girl has grown up and wants to go to college. And we think she should get married. Great master said, what have girls to do with marriage, with the college? They have to run the home. No, no, get her married, run a home. Within 10 minutes, he's giving two different answers to different people. Now, if a third person comes and says, which one applies to me? None of them applies to you. Your circumstances may be different. That is why there's a limitation on the usefulness of these questions that we can ask. And we can ask questions and we get answers to satisfy our mind, to keep it satisfied to the extent it will allow us to take step number one, to start. That's it. The rest is depending on the experiences. Now, talking about questions, I know there are some questions with Jonathan here. Maybe I should try to answer them now and see to whom it applies. It will certainly apply to the person who written the question. May apply to some more people also, or may not. How do we act on intuition when the correct choice does not seem obvious? How, the question I'll read again. How do we act on intuition when the correct choice doesn't seem obvious? Don't act. A simple answer. If choice is not obvious, don't act. At least we have one advantage that we can act or not act. So if the choice is not obvious with intuition, then don't act. Wait for the next intuition. Why is ritual sacrifice so prevalent in ancient religions, Hinduism, Judaism, etc., and why was it later abandoned? Why is ritual sacrifice so prevalent in ancient religions, Hinduism, Judaism, etc., and why was it later abundant? It was ritual sacrifice of the most vital animal called the human mind. That was the intention. The mind has to be sacrificed. If you want to reach the spirit, the mind has to be sacrificed. You have to give up many of the things the mind wants. And this was a symbolic way. So many symbols have been misused. Religions use spiritual symbols. All religions have used spiritual symbols. For example, you build a dome structure. And most religions built dome structures in the beginning to worship. The dome was purely a symbol of the head of a human being. To just to remind you where the real dome is and people began to think that they'll find salvation and they'll find truth in the dome. We are, ourselves are built. We've done this with religion all the time. Symbols were used because it's very difficult to tell the reality. These symbols were long lasting and there was no, no media like today, no newspapers, no iPhones, no internet nothing to share information. These symbols were built for that purpose. And there's so many symbols. In fact, one researcher, Charles Campbell, had done research on the symbols that had been used with religion and what the original significance was. Six volumes of his books. And I saw that he was able to explain many of them what the symbols were for. The sacrifice for the sacrifice of your mind. The mind is an animal. They called it like that. And yet we began to kill not only animals, 
we killed human beings human sacrifices took place so today there is more better way of getting properly informed now we properly informed these are symbolic things and that is why these sacrifices have been given up one more guru ji please guide me that how to develop unconditional love and devotion toward master guru ji is it we need to put forth effort or it automatically happens please guide me how to develop unconditional love and devotion towards master is it we are need to write efforts for it it automatically happens love has nothing to do with effort how many people out of you who love to people here have made efforts for it it came spontaneously you pulled by love love pulls you love cannot be made and grown like that you can grow something similar to love called attachment we call attachments love attachments are very different from love when you are attached to something or a person you are attached to a person you feel close to that person you feel you want to do something with that person you expect something from that person and your consciousness is aware of you and that person in fact more aware of you than the other person in the attachment which we call a love bond a lover is more conscious of himself or herself than the beloved people use this phrase all the time i love you i look at them people say i love you they repeat many times that means they are not very certain and they keep on repeating to be sure that they love each other and if the other person says but i don't love you the love of the first person also becomes then i also don't love you the second thing is expectations that what will i get if i love you what will you give me in return if you give me nothing in return why should i love you how can you use the word love for that kind of relationship the ego game is very strong in that kind of attachment which we call love it's the i i love i is in forefront of you when you say i love you it is a become all the cliche people are just talking all the time i love you i love you or oh, you also love i love my house i love my cat i love my dog i love my children i love everybody where is the word coming up more frequently i i i i do this i do this most of this so called love is a ego game when you have real love what happens whether it's with the master or with another person the real love comes you forget yourself the beloved occupies your thoughts and mind you put your ego in the back seat you can't even speak sometimes because the beloved is all in your mind that's love love reduces your ego and by the way i found that the only thing i found in this world that reduces the ego is love it has to be true love love there the beloved draws you and you forget who you are you only think of the beloved we can't love a master by saying let's try to love the master let's put in some more effort the master's love must draw something in us if it doesn't either is not the master or is not your master or you have to wait to get that experience but the love of a master has to come from the master when it comes you automatically like to do something which is called devotion that is why the terms are used love and devotion you cannot love you can be devoted and your devotion is like love your devotion is that i don't want to displease the master i'd like to follow what he says i'd like to have more of his company one of the main thing that happens in love is you like to spend more time with the beloved and when you feel that inclination you don't say i am loving you are being pulled to have desiring more company automatically coming in you that is why love is something different from what we are calling love we are calling attachments as love in attachments 
is always awareness of two, more awareness of yourself than the person you are attached to. In love, you forget yourself and the beloved takes place in your own mind and thinking. So to love the master is to be pulled by the master, desire to see him more often. If that doesn't come, forget it. It's not worth it. If there is no pull by a master, what are you searching for then? If you want to have teachings, there are lots of masters, thousands of them. If you just want to get teaching, how to meditate, thousands of them. But the perfect living master comes into your life when you are pulled by love. Some people asked me, I know five masters, which one should I follow? I said, I don't know the qualifications of those five. But a simple rule of thumb is, whoever pulls you with, your, with his love, follow him. One man wrote to me, I have two masters and I don't know which one to follow. I gave the same reply, follow the one who pulls you. He replied back, both of them are pulling me. I said, you are very lucky, we can't find one who pulls us. You found two, follow either of them. So it is something different, love for a master is different. But once the pull starts, then you have conversation with the master inside every day. Love grows by itself. Your devotion grows by itself. The experience is happening outside. You begin to know this master must have done. It couldn't have happened otherwise. This is master doing. It can't happen. Devotion and love automatically grow. And as coincidences grow, love and devotion both grow simultaneously. Well, thank you very much for spending time with me and I am very happy I could share some of these teachings. These, what I share with you is derived directly from the teachings of great master whose picture you see, Azur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh Ji. I had the experience of getting initiated from him. I had the experience of being skeptical and doubting his teachings. I had the experience of running away from him. I had the experience of trying many other paths and many kinds of yogas and eventually came back and found that this this method of being pulled by love and the mechanical side of it being pulled by a sound within us, a sound that is inside all of us, the melody and the sound inside us is the best I have found. That is why I recommend to somebody, any friends of mine who want to experience what I am talking about, follow the method of Surat Shabd Yoga which means putting attention on the sound within. The sound is continuous up to our true home and it, the spectacle varies, the experiences vary, level of creation varies, but the sound continues all the way. The sound, the practice of listening to sound, the melody inside, the good system. But it will only work eventually if you are seeking is strong in your heart. If your seeking is weak, I am just trying to check out what's happening, then you are not ready. If you say, uh, I am quite happy, but I would like to see what else is there, not ready. If your seeking is so strong, I have done with this, I am tired of it, I have had enough of it, I want to go back to my true home where I belong. A perfect living master who will pull you with his love will automatically come into your life. Nothing to worry. Don't search only seek. Don't seek by speaking, by shouting. Seek inside your head, speak, seek inside your heart and the master will appear in your life. Thank you very much.